we can use message authentication codes to perform the service of authentication and data integrity. And we went through a few examples. Basic idea is that we take our message and we calculate the MAC of the message using some secret key shared only between the, the source and the destination. And the MAC, we sometimes the output we call a tag or even just a code or a, a message authentication code. The MAC is uh, attached to the message and sent and what the receiver does is checks, verifies the received message by comparing the MAC of the received message with the received MAC. Okay, that is, we receive a message plus the tag and the receiver verifies by calculating the tag for the received message, comparing it to the received tag, and they should be the same. Because the nature of the MAC algorithm should be such that two different input messages with the same key will produce different outputs, different tags. So. If the message is the same as the original, then we'll get the original tag back. So the verification takes place there. The other two diagrams here are just combining the MAC with encryption. The first case, the data is not encrypted. So someone can see the data, it's just authenticated. The second two cases are the data is both encrypted and authenticated. And the difference between them is the order in which the MAC and the encryption is applied. In the, the middle diagram, calculate the MAC and then encrypt. In the bottom diagram, encrypt and then MAC. And if you see how, for example, secure shell works, and if you capture some secure shell packets, some of you have done that in a lab, then you'll see that a common form of a, a authentication use is the bottom one of encrypt and then MAC. Okay, that is you encrypt the, the data first and then calculate the MAC on the ciphertext. But the difference between those two is, is not significant. Encrypt and MAC or MAC then encrypt. There are subtle differences, so there are some recommended approaches, but we will not go through them. Uh, both are considered secure in general cases, but there may be some specific cases where one is better than the other. Commonly, encrypt then MAC is used. And we got to where? Let's look at the security of Max. Just briefly talk about uh, how someone can try to attack a message authentication uh, code algorithm. We had some examples where the idea was from the attacker, I think we have one here, the malicious user tries to modify the message. So in this was the case where the malicious user intercepted the message and the tag that was sent. They changed the message, but not the tag. They send it on to B, hoping B will think this is the real message. But because of the message authentication code was used, B calculates using the key shared between itself and A on the received message, using the MAC function and gets a calculated tag, compares it to the received tag, and they will be different. And in that way, B detects something's gone wrong and doesn't trust the message. And we covered a few other cases, the other possible cases, and we see that assuming that the algorithm will produ produce two different messages with, or well, two different messages will produce two different tags, or using two different keys will produce two different tags. Assuming those rules hold, then the attack will be unsuccessful. What about brute force attack? What can the attacker do? And I'll bring up one of the other cases that we considered. I think we have it here. This one. This didn't work for our attacker. What could they try to do in a brute force attack? How can the attacker make a change such that the receiver B doesn't detect the change? 
and in a brute force attack, how could they do that? What do they need to, to do? What was the problem in this case? What could the attacker not do? They didn't know the key. Okay, so here they change the message, they modify the message, they want to recalculate the tag of that modified message, but they don't have the key that B is going to use to check. B is going to use the key shared between itself and A. The attacker doesn't know that, so must use some other key. Well, a brute force attack, try and guess the key. That's the basic idea here. If you try and if you could find the key, then you can be successful in attacking. Because if if the malicious user did know KAB, they could use it here and send the message, and B would not know the message was modified. So one approach from a brute force perspective is try all possible keys. And we'll do a little bit of analysis and see that approach. So the security of a MAC algorithm with respect to brute force, one thing it depends upon is the length of the key. To stop a brute force attack on a key, make the key long. Yeah, that's our, our general rule. So the key must be of a, a reasonable length, more than 100 bits most likely. But there is another way that the attacker can try and attack, and that's to try and guess a tag, even without the key. Uh, let's see. If they can find a message that produces this, they, if they can find two different messages that produce the same tag, they can be successful in an attack as well. Because we said that the success of the authentication depends upon the fact that two different messages produce two different tags. That's what we depend upon, but we've also said in theory, because there are more possible messages than tags, some messages will map to the same tag. So the challenge of the attacker is to find two messages that produce the same tag. Let's see the, the concepts and then go through an example. So in terms of the, an attack, we assume that the MAC function is known. They, they know what the algorithm is. They don't know the key. Okay. Uh, I think there's a typo here. Instead of for, it should be find. They want to find a valid MAC code for a given message X. Okay, not for, find valid MAC. Find a tag for a given message without knowing the key. If they can do that, then they can defeat the authentication schemes. So it should be hard for an attacker to find the tag without knowing the key. And one way to state that is computation resistance. That is, if the attacker knows multiple, or one or more pairs of some message, X here, and the tag of that message, so the MAC of some key of that same message, if the attacker knows the tag and the message and multiple pairs, it still should be hard for the attacker to be able to find the, the tag for some other message. That is, if the attacker has some message X, it should be hard for the attacker to find the corresponding tag. That states the requirement here. So given the message, you can't find the tag unless you have the key, of course, but the assumption is we don't have the key. Even if we've seen other tags and messages used with the same key. We will not go through a proof or the details of the, the security, but just to quickly state the, the approximate strengths of message authentication codes. There are two brute force attacks. Try and guess the key, or try and find the tag or the MAC value without knowing the key. And there are some, so for example, brute force attack on the key, the attacker knows, for example, some message, X1, and the corresponding tag. 
where that tag T1 was calculated using a key on that message. The attacker doesn't know the key. A brute force attack, try all possible keys. So the attacker knows the MAC function, they know X1, they take the first possible key, calculate the MAC, get a tag. If it produces T1, then potentially they've found the correct key. If not, try another key. So they try all possible keys in this function here. Key 1 with X1, look at the output. If it matches the known T1, then that's a possible key. If not, ignore that key. And try all possible keys. The number of attempts, if we have a key of k bits, is 2 to the power of k. So if our key is 100 bits long, they need 2 to the power of 100 attempts to try all possible keys. Uh, there's, for this attack to be successful, usually the attacker may need to try with multiple pairs. But that's not so hard. That is, that may be that multiple keys will produce the correct tag. In which case the attacker needs to try with a different pair of message and tag. And the pairs that produce the, use the correct key, the same key will give us the answer. The main point is that a brute force attack on the key depends upon the key length. And approximately the amount of effort is 2 to the power of k. Worst case. That is, if I need to try all keys and the key is k bits long, I need to take 2 to the power of k attempts. And a MAC function is usually, in terms of computation on your computer, is in the order of the same time to do an encryption function. So 2 to the power of 100 attempts, we've seen in brute force on symmetric key encryption, uh, 2 to the power of 128 is going to take billions of years. 2 to the power of 64 may be possible. So usually anything above 80, 90 or 100 bits is, is going to be secure. So make the key long enough to avoid a brute force attack on the key. Let's, let's consider, consider a simple example. I don't have a real MAC function, but I have a fake one that we can use with small values. Uh, let me see what we can do. I have a fake MAC function that we'll use. And the, the parameters of that are that in the first instance, we have a key of, the key is 3 bits. The MAC function takes, the key is input and a message and produces a tag where the tag is, in the first example I'll show, is 4 bits. And the message in my simple MAC function I will show you is limited to 8 bits. So this is not a realistic MAC function, it's just a simple one to demonstrate the numbers uh, in a brute force attack. So every message as input is fixed at 8 bits and when we take the MAC of a message using a 3-bit key we get a 4-bit tag. How many possible messages? Which is 2 to the power of 8 is 256 possible messages, different messages with 8 bits. And how many possible tags? 16 possible tags. Do we have collisions? What's a collision? Two or more messages mapped to the same tag. So there are 256 possible messages. If we use the same key, we can get 16 possible tags as output. This is the input.
which implies that some messages must map to the same tag. There's no way that applying the MAC function on two different messages will always produce two different tags because we don't have enough tags for each of the messages. And that's, that's the same in the general case with a MAC function that the number of tags is much smaller than the number of possible messages. So when I say collisions, I mean two different inputs produce the same tag as output. In theory, possible. And definitely in this case, uh, quite easy. On average, how many messages map to the same tag? I know you've all done the statistics lesson on Moodle. You go, you, I know you've all studied statistics, so you're experts on statistics and probabilities, especially. On average, how many messages produce the same tag? Two, 256 divided by 16 on average if we have random mappings so 16 messages mapped to the one tag on average if it's random and a MAC function should be random that is it takes an input and produces a random output so for a first example I'll say we have the attacker knows a tag. The tag equals, in my example, will show is they know a tag and they know the corresponding message. So, for example, in the past, a user has taken that message, those eight bits, used the secret key K and obtained the tag 1110. The attacker has intercepted them. The attacker now wants to find the key. What do they do? How do they find K in a brute force attack? What are you going to do? Try all possible keys, Try all possible keys in the MAC function. That is, with that message M, try the first possible key, let's say 000, and calculate the MAC. If it gets the tag 1110, then we're on track. If it doesn't, try another key. Now, the example I'll show is, again, not a real MAC function. It's just one to, to give some example numbers as output. Let me find it. Uh, so we've got a tag. Just remember, 1110. And a message. What I just wrote. And I've got a MAC function that, that takes the message and a secret key. I'm not going to tell you the secret key. It's secret. And it produces a tag. So I've got something that will try all keys on that message. Basically what this function does is tries key 000 using this message and calculates the tag. And we'll see the output. And then it tries key 001 on that message, gets the tag, and does it for all keys. How many keys? 2 to the power of 3, 8 keys. In our case, there are 8 possible keys, just to keep it simple. It tries all the keys, it gets the tags. What's the key, do you think? There was my brute force attack. I'm the attacker. What's the key? What, I, what this code did was took this message, tried key 000, and it produced the tag 1011. 
I know if that message uses the secret key, it should produce this tag. So this is not the right key. So I try 001. It doesn't produce the expected tag. We keep going, and what do we get? 101. Okay, so in this case, we've found the key is 101. Because that key, with the same message as the, what we know, produces the expected tag. So that's the brute force attack on keys. Now, in some cases, it may be that uh, two different keys produce the same tag. If that happened, then we'd need to try it on another known pair. So in this attack, the attacker knows the pair of tag and message, just one pair. If two keys produce the same tag, we'd need to try those two keys on a second pair, which wouldn't be hard. How many attempts? Dot slash means run the program which is in this directory. Dot means this directory, slash is a directory is a separator. I'm not going to go through the Mac function, I'm just trying to illustrate the number of attempts it takes. Try all keys is just my own function that tries a Mac function on all possible keys. On average, or worst case, how many keys do we need to try? In this case, we took six, I think. Worst case, how many keys with this algorithm? Eight. So in the best case, I find it up front. In the worst case, it takes all eight. On average, it would take four. So worst case is eight in this case. In general, two to the power of k. k is the key length. In this case, it's three. So that's one attack from the attacker's perspective. In this case, it made sense to attack the key. The key was three bits. It the, that was the weakest part of the algorithm. But another example, same algorithm but slightly different parameters. Let's say in a second case we have an algorithm that takes uh, the key is 5 bits. The tag it produces is 4 bits still. And the message is also 8 bits. Brute force attack on the key. How many attempts? Worst case. 32, 2 to the power of 5. Okay, 5-bit five key. We need to try 32, so we could do that. But let's look at a, a, <coughs> excuse me, a different attack. Let's say we know the attacker knows some tag, or they want to generate some tag. And it's 0101. Zero, one, zero, one. That is, in this attack, the attacker wants to find a message that the other two users when they use their shared secret key, the attacker doesn't know the key, they want to find a message that produces this tag. That is... With some key, which is secret, we don't know that, we want to find the message that will produce that tag. So that we could defeat the authentication schemes. Because if we can find a message that produces the same tag of another message, we can uh, make changes without the receiver notifying, uh, being, uh, being aware. This attack is slightly more complicated or it relies on some different assumptions and the assumption is that the attacker can somehow ask the user to apply the MAC using their secret key on different messages. 
So let's say the attacker knows user A, and somehow they can get user A to say, oh, here's a message, please calculate the MAC for me. So the attacker sends a message to user A and, and says, calculate the, the MAC. User A does it using their secret, they don't tell the attacker the secret, and the attacker learns the tag. So there's some sort of way that, uh, some sort of service that allows the attacker to find the MAC of a message without knowing the secret. So what the attacker can do is try some message, some random message, ask the user to calculate for that message using their secret key, the MAC, when we get the tag. If it matches the tag that we want, then the attacker has found the, the message. Let's try that and, and see how that helps the attacker. So again, this has a key of five bits. The key is secret. We're not trying to find the key. We're trying to find some message that when we use with that key, will produce the tag 0101. And my attacker, again, uh, the tag 0101, what the attacker does is can try random messages. What the attacker does is chooses a random message, some message, sends it to the user, and the user will calculate the tag of that message, and the attacker learns the tag. If it matches 0101, then the attacker is successful because I've found a message without knowing the key that maps to the tag that they want. So this program, all it does is calculates for random messages the tag with the secret key and prints them out. And the way that it works is that it stops once it finds that tag. So in this instance, what it did was, given this random message and the key that we don't know, but we got the user to calculate the MAC with their key and we found out the tag is 1001. That's not of use to us. We want 0101. So we try another message. And we get 0111. No, we keep trying until we get 0101. Now the attacker has found some message that produces their desired tag. And they can take advantage of that by, for example, um, sending a message to B 0101111 with the tag 0101. If they send that to B, B will verify it to be correct because B has the key that produces that mapping. So that's how the attacker can take advantage of this. The point is, how many attempts do we need to make until we get the matching tag? In this case, because it's random messages, it took, I don't know, you can count them there better than me, but uh, maybe 20 something attempts there. I'll try it again, because it's random, it will be different this time. A little bit longer, I'll keep trying. Oh, that one took five attempts. Maybe a screen full, which is about 15 to 20 attempts, and keep trying. Oh, this one's maybe 10 attempts. If we keep trying, because it's random, it will vary. On average, how many attempts do we need to take until we get the right tag? Oh, average or worst case? Worst case, to be uh, simple. What's the worst case? No. Or the average of these values that we just did? What do you think it is? So we had one which was 5, one with 12, one looked like 20, 25. If we kept doing and took the average, what do you think it will take? What does it depend upon? It doesn't depend upon the key length.
It depends upon the tag length. How many possible tags are there? 16 possible tags. So basically the MAC function takes some random input and produces one of those 16 values. So after 16 attempts, we should possibly get one of the, the, the value that we're looking for because ours is one of the 16 values but unfortunately in some cases an attempt produces the, the same tag. But on average, if, if it's a random mapping and we're looking for a random tag, it would take 16 attempts to find our tag. It depends upon the tag length. Basically the, the idea is uh, apply some function on a random input that produces one of those random 16 outputs. On average you need 16 attempts to get that output. So the attacker in this case will be successful. The success depends upon the length of the tag. How do we make it harder for the attacker then? Longer tag. Okay. So the longer the tag, the less chance that they'll find it. So there are two different approaches from the attacker. And we'll go back to the lecture notes. Actually, just to summarize here, in the first case we said if we try all keys, it depends upon the key length. Three bits take eight attempts. If we try to find a tag by trying random messages, it depends upon the tag length. Four bits in this case. So, in general, a brute force attack on the key takes approximately two to the power of k attempts. A brute force attack on the tag, on the MAC value, depends upon the length of that tag. For an n-bit MAC value, an n-bit tag takes 2 to the power of n attempts. So from an attacker's perspective, they would choose the easiest of the two. To defeat the MAC scheme, choose the one which is easier. So the, the effort to defeat the MAC in a brute force attack is the minimum of 2 to the power of the number of bits in the key and 2 to the power of the number of bits in the tag. If we had a MAC scheme, a MAC function that had a key of 80 bits and a tag of 60 bits, what would you as the attacker try to do? A brute force attack on the key or a brute force attack on the tag? On the tag, the one which is easier. Okay, so that's why we say that the strength of the MAC depends upon the minimum length of the key and the tag. So basically we need to make sure the tag and the key are both long enough to make a brute force attack not possible. So as long as the, t the key and the tag are long, Macs are considered secure against brute force. Can, can we try it for 60 bits? You will try it at home and leave your computer running and see, see how much power you use over a week. Okay? Uh, with 60 bits, uh, you, you can do it, but I think it will still take a long time on a single computer. So uh, a, a brute force attack, I think we said on desk, which was 64 bits, or actually 56 bits, uh, is possible today. And I, the numbers that it takes uh, on powerful computers or a group of computers, probably minutes to defeat. But on a single computer, that, that extends. Maybe if you took control of the network lab, you'll get it quite quickly. 
use all, all 36 computers. Right, brute force is not practical if we make the values long enough, and that's easy. Okay, so most Mac algorithms used, or all Mac algorithms are used, we, we use values which are long enough. Okay. But the main point is that we need both the key and the tag to be long enough. It's not just the key anymore. So that's brute force attacks. The other attacks uh, to take advantage of weaknesses in the algorithms. There are many different algorithms, so there are some theoretical attacks on some of the popular algorithms. But generally, Mac algorithms, the ones which are in use today, are considered secure. Okay. So just make sure that the lengths are large enough and the Macs are considered secure. We mentioned in the previous lecture that there are many different algorithms. We're not going to go through any specific one. The next topic is about hash functions, which we'll go through. And then we'll mention that there's a hash functions and MAC functions are used for similar things. And the, there is a MAC function called HMAC, which really takes an existing hash function and turns it into a MAC function. So that's commonly used in network communications. If you saw in secure shell and we capture packets, you'll see that HMAC is, is used in that case. 